Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening for our wellness series. I'm Erin Hodgson, one of our diabetes educators. Tonight, I have the privilege of introducing one of our incredible endocrinologists and clinical professor of medicine at Stanford, Dr. Marina Bassina. Dr. Bassina's focus is diabetes management and technology. She is well known and admired in the type one diabetes community. She has a busy clinical practice here at Stanford and serves as medical director of inpatient diabetes service. She has received numerous teaching awards, the Stanford Hospital Award for Excellence in Patient Care, and is on the board for Sugar Mamas, Beyond Type 1, and T1D Exchange. If you have questions during the session, go ahead and enter them in the Q&A, and Dr. Bassina will respond throughout the presentation. And now I will hand it over to Dr. Bassina for her talk on the impact exercise has on blood glucose. Thank you, Erin, for introduction. And thank you very everyone for being here. So it's so exciting to see so many um, participants. So this is uh, on Thursday night. So this is really, really great. Um, thanks for being here. Um, so today's topic is, as Erin um, mentioned, so the exercise uh, effect or impact on general health and diabetes and um, diabetes control and how to exercise safely. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, um, so just to give some definition and some importance of the exercise. Um, in general, exercise is planned, structured physical activity with aim of increasing fitness. Um, this is just a, a, the definition of exercise. It improves glycemic control uh, via acute responses and also a chronic adaptation of muscles and systemic responses, which are uh, changes or adaptations in the liver, neural system, immune, endocrine, and also metabolic factors. It is central to help achieve and maintain target glucose control and, in general, improve quality of life, improve well being, and uh, even adding to the energy level on a daily basis. Um, so, exercise. Um, so, there's some prescriptions that we can. Uh, usually that we advise or give patients um, during the clinic, uh, but uh, those prescriptions come from various organizations. So one of the organizations that gives us recommendation and guidelines is American College of Sports Medicine and also American Diabetes Association. Both agree on the prescription of exercise uh, with initial instruction for periodic supervision by a qualified exercise trainer is recommended for most people with type 2 diabetes, especially for resistant training, to ensure optimal benefits for blood glucose control, blood pressure, lipids, cardiovascular risk factors, and to minimize injuries and um, to minimize the risks of uh, starting exercise too extensively um, at the beginning. So for essential for the terminology of exercise. Um, so we're looking at some leisure time physical activity. This is activities during our free time. That includes walking, hiking, gardening, sports, dance, formal exercise training. So exercise is uh, kind of quantified by, a, by metabolic equivalent. So one metabolic equivalent is the rate at which adult burn calories at rest, which is about one kilocalories per kilogram per hour, um, and walking at ground level with moderate pace. Um, it burns about 3.3 kilocalories per kilogram per hour. So as you can see, it's great for just general health. It's great for um, cardiovascular health, but it's not providing as much of the calorie burning. So if somebody said, you know, I'm gonna eat this Oreo cookie and or a couple of those cookies and then do exercise. 
So it takes quite a bit of time to uh, to burn that one cookie or two cookies. So it's um, it's again we're doing the exercise mainly for um, just improvement of well-being, for cardiovascular health, for blood pressure and blood sugars, but not as much for the weight loss in general. So exercise training is a subcategory of the leisure time activity. Um, it uh, requires planned, structured, and repetitive bodily movement. It designed to improve and maintain one or more components of physical health. So cardiorespiratory strength and flexibility. So for the resistant exercise, it's an anaerobic exercise. And that one designed specifically to increase muscular strength, power, and endurance by varying um, the resistance uh, during the exercise. Um, so there's also occupational physical activity. So depending on the type of work the individual does, um, some activity can be fairly strenuous during the just routine workday. And that's activity that is associated with an occupation or job or somebody can have sedentary work just sitting in the computer the whole day. And it usually over eight hours unless um, somebody will have extended uh, work day and extended work hours. So types of the exercise would be stretching. So this is mainly for flexibility uh, of the joints and muscles, weightlifting, as we said, for straight, strengthening muscles and bone mass, uh, we're saying that weight, any weight bearing exercise and even walking, um, you are still kind of bearing your weight. So it's also good. We are also always recommending it for the bone mass uh, improvement. And the um, aerobic exercise or cardiac exercise, it's uh, for cardiovascular health. So recommendations for exercise is um, to have moderate intensity aerobic activity about 150 minutes per week um, and muscle um, or strengthening activity in addition uh, to that. So at least two days of the week. Now, uh, when we look at the data, uh, actually less than 20% of the patients uh, with diabetes exercise more than two times per week. 60% do no structured exercise and just sort of random, not without the specific planning of the time and type of time or type of exercise. For the type of exercise, for aerobic activity, mainly relies on the aerobic energy producing system and anaerobic or resistant or strength exercise on the anaerobic energy producing system. There is also a type of exercise that called HIT or high intensity interval training. Those are brief periods of vigorous exercise and recovery at a low to moderate intensity. And they're both a combination of aerobic or anaerobic exercise. So for any for aerobic exercise, there are many types that can be um, included. So it would be cyclic, swimming, walking, running, skip, um, skipping, or hiking. So whichever physical activity you would um, like or more enjoying. Uh, enjoying. Um, for um, also American College of Sports Medicine and ADA recommendations for specifically aerobic exercise recommends at least three days a week with no more than two consecutive days between the bouts of physical activity, at least having moderate intensity. For most people with type 2 diabetes, brisk walking is considered moderate intensity exercise. And as I mentioned previously, it would be 150 minutes uh, per week um, to achieve optimal coronary heart disease risk reduction. In any form of exercise that uses large muscle groups and causes sustained increase in heart rate is, um, it is for um, the aerobic exercise. So it is recommended to gradually progress, um, not to uh, start with extensive exercise. And this is to minimize the risk of injury, particularly if health complications are already present and also to enhance compliance, not to start with extensive exercise and then not being able to do anything for the week after that extensive exercise. 
So for the resistant exercise, the purpose of it is building the muscle, increasing the metabolism to develop and to maintain muscle strength, muscle power, and muscle endurance. So benefits for um, have been shown that it can prevent uh, chronic diseases. It's also, as we mentioned, it maximizes and maintains the bone mass. It's improved the posture and reduces the risk of the back injuries. But again, um, structured exercise with some um, consultation before starting this exercise would be advisable. Uh, for recommendations for resistant exercise would be at least twice a week on non-consecutive days, ideally three times per week as a part of a physical activity program for individual with type 2 diabetes with um, and <coughs> combining with regular aerobic activity. Intensity, moderate to vigorous. Duration, each session can be only for five to 10 minutes and involving major muscle groups, upper body, lower body, and core. So it can involve um, 10 to 15 repetitions of to being near fatigue per, um, it's to set in early training and then progressing um, as um, the muscles get stronger to uh, more of the intense um, exercise. Um, so for intensity of exercise, um, it's expressed in relation to the capacity of the person performing that activity. So the key factor is how it is resp in response to exercise for achieving health outcomes. So exercise stimulus to specific tissue is greater than usually, uh, than in a usual daily activity experience. Um, and um, in type two diabetes, the intensity, actual specific intensity is debatable. So any exercise is good, even if it's not the intense uh, level. And uh, similar to um, intense to a non-significant intense, there should be uh, there are uh, some non-significant but improvement in clinical outcomes with cholesterol reduction and cardiovascular fitness. So the recommendation for specific activities um, for the intensity recommendations, um, if we look at this 150 minutes per week would be brief walking, which uh, is over three miles per hour, bicycling, um, water aerobics, tennis, um, ballroom dancing, uh, general gardening, and for vigorous activity, that would be uphill walking or race, um, walking, bicycling over 10 miles per hour, riding or jogging, tennis, aerobic dancing, or heavy gardening. Um, for the high intensity for the HIIT training, um, that includes bouts of intensity exercise. It can be anywhere from 15 seconds to four minutes with over 90% of the max uh, O2 uptake, followed by recovery period uh, of equal or longer duration than um, the actual uh, high intensity interval. So possibly it may provide greater changes in metabolic pathway and benefits. Uh, so there are quite a few studies done in the heat exercise that suggested that. So that graph sort of shows um, this kind of hit and periods of relaxation and um, so the, the type of that exercise. Um, so what are the benefits uh, of exercise in individuals with chronic conditions? So it had been shown that exercise improves cholesterol. It improves or decreases resistance to insulin. It reduces blood pressure. It increases in coronary blood flow and decreases demand and myocardial consumption. Um, um, so for a cardioprotective mechanism of physical activity, it's for physiologic, psychological, social interactions, reduction stress, reduction depression, antiarrhythmic effect, it increases heart rate variability, it decreases adrenergic activity and it increases the vagal tone, which is reduces actually the heart rate. It has some antithrombotic or anti-clotting effect. So it increases or promotes the lysis of the clots. It reduces adhesion of the platelets that usually cause those or lead to those clots. 
it reduces the blood viscosity. It has the anti-atherosclerotic effect, which is, as I mentioned, increase insulin sensitivity. As we know, it improves or increases the good cholesterol, HDL, high density lipoprotein. It reduces the bad cholesterol, LDL. It reduces triglycerides, reduces blood pressure, reduces fat tissue, and also has the anti-inflammatory effect. For the hemodynamics, it um, improves the cardiac remodeling. It increases the flow to the, car to the heart from coronary vessels. It reduces the demand of the oxygen for the heart tissue, for the heart muscle. It improves the, uh, the inside the vessel, the endothelial function. And it increases the nitric, nitric oxide that also causes the vasodilation of the blood vessels. So how do we benefit? Uh, how do we benefit from exercise without getting extra risks of the exercise? Uh, because um, it's sometimes, most of the time, is challenging. And patients uh, in clinic ask us a lot: How do I exercise safely? Because um, it's a balancing act, right? So it's um, fatigue after the exercise. It's low blood sugar during or after exercise. So we'll go over some of the. Um, important uh, advices or some of the um, um, things that you can use in your um, exercise routine. So it's sort of a double-edged sword because once, um, if, you're use, if you start with pretty significant or intense exercise, there can be increased risk for uh, musculoskeletal injuries if your muscles are not got, got used yet to exercise. There could be on cardiovascular complications in somebody who has underlying heart disease. So those individuals are uh, advised to check with their healthcare providers to make sure it's safe for them to exercise and what kind of exercise would be safe to do to avoid the heart attack. So we said it decreased heart demands, but if they are already um, blood clots or um, those atherosclerotic clots are present, or patients who is prone to arrhythmia. So those patients definitely need to first get an advice from the healthcare providers. Establishing risk profile for various exercise regimen in different uh, patients and providing benefits at minimal risk at um, somebody who's at high risk for um, different complications. So most risks associated with exercise, low blood sugars for someone who is either on insulin or agents that can lower the blood sugar, could be again, cardiac complications, somebody who is not heart fit and uh, start with more vigorous exercise. So somebody who has underlying retinopathy or um, the um, especially proliferative retinopathy with the new vessel um, kind of growing into the uh, back of the eye, into the fundus of the eye, it can promote bleeding inside the eye. So talking to your doctor would be very important. It can increase protein excretion in the urine in somebody who already has underlying kidney problem. It can cause changes in the blood pressure. Again, if somebody is not fit for exercise, doing extensive exercise can acutely raise the blood pressure. Somebody who cannot uh, feel well on the feet and wearing too tight shoes that can increase risk of foot ulcers, not being able to feel, um, you know, some um, um, damage that being done during that exercise and possible problem with thermoregulation. Oh, Dr. Bessina, you have a question. Okay. Can you explain the mechanism of anti-arithmetic uh, effect of exercise? Could you could, would exercise decrease arrhythmia? Um, so it, it's, uh, re, it reduces the, um, the chance of arrhythmia in somebody who doesn't, who have the, uh, for example, uh, chronic atrial fibrillation, for example, right? So, or any kind of um, the arrhythmia because it improves the, um, the neuronal system. Um, and we'll uh, talk a little about that a little bit, but as we mentioned, it increases or improves the vagal tone. So the vagal tone is the, the tone that reduces or um, slows down the heart rate. So with, especially with the doing the um, sort of structured exercise um, and the exercise that would be 
um, particularly targeted for uh, for you uh, would be to say how safe you can raise your heart rate uh, for that particular exercise. Um, so improving the nerve nerve conduction uh, system through the um, uh, through the um, the 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 rhythm the the rhythm modulators of the of the heart or the stimulators of the heart. So I don't know if I it exactly answered your question, but it sort of um, depends on the underlying heart condition, if any. So if there is um, some sort of underlying heart condition, then it may actually cause proarrhythmic effect if started too extensive exercise. But if it's somebody with a healthy heart, then it reduces the just in general improves cardiovascular health. Okay. I think you um, answered this, but they have a follow-up question, but um, they're just wondering if aerobic exercise is what you're talking about to be beneficial. Yes, so um, it's an aerobic exercise, mainly beneficial, but again, uh, to make sure that you are um, increasing your heart rate safely. So um, to uh, target it to particularly your um, complications, if, if any, from either diabetes or heart disease. Thank you. Yeah, so there is a maximal heart rate achieved that uh, is safe and that says for um, calculated for a particular individual. Um, so being cautious with pre-existing complications, um, that's what we just discussed. So somebody who has autonomic neuropathy or a longstanding uncontrolled diabetes, so as we started talking about the heart, um, so one of the conditions that we always worry about that had been studied extensively and still we don't know much about, uh, and we still try to do a lot more studies in this condition, is called autonomic cardiac neuropathy. Basically what that means is that the heart is not able to accommodate to the degree of exercise or to the body's need. Um, so normally when heart, should speed up, um, heart is not able to do it. Um, and, or, um, so be, if the heart at rest, um, heart beating is faster than normal. So at that point, we suspect this cardiac neuropathy, autonomic neuropathy. So for those individuals, it's good to consult with your doctors and start with low intensity exercise. And um, again, in, as I mentioned before, in somebody who has unstable retinopathy, um, somebody who has severe though autonomic neuropathy, renal insufficiency. So again, avoiding vigorous exercise, avoiding heavy lifting, and avoiding the competitive endurance sports. If somebody has pre-existing heart disease or at a high risk for heart disease, again, consult with your healthcare provider. So for someone who is on insulin or either type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes are uh, treated with insulin, there are multiple factors that affecting the blood glucose responses. And again, it's hard for anyone to be able to account for all those factors. So first, as we discussed, it's the type of exercise, um, how intensive it is, what duration of exercise, what is the timing of exercise in, re uh, in relationship to the medication, or to the meal? What is your individual training status? Um, also the regimen changes, uh, which, uh, what are you starting? What is your starting glucose? How much insulin on board or a medication on board that you have at the start of the exercise? When was the last food intake? Um, environmental factors, heat or cold, humidity or altitude can affect it. Body concern, um, physical or mental stress, nutritional status, being the hydration status, how much glycogen or the glucose as a backup for your exercise accumulated in muscle and liver. For women, what cycle, what part of the cycle of the menstrual um, period the, the woman is. For hypoglycemia-associated autonomic failure, prior hypoglycemia, uh, prior exercise experience, somebody who had, for example, hypoglycemia a few hours prior to the exercise, this glycogen um, 
resource source that we uh, accumulate in the muscle and liver that could have been already burned out with the previous um, hypoglycemia several few hours on that same day. So you may not have accumulated enough glycogen in the liver and muscles to be used during the exercise. So you would be at significantly high risk for going low during that particular exercise. So again, a lot of factors to consider, unfortunately. Um, we wish we would be easier uh, than that. Um, so also uh, the blood glucose responses are variable and those are dependent on type of exercise. And specifically the recommendations are provided for some, this is mainly taken from uh, Dr. Mike Rydell, who is doing a lot of research. He's from Canada um, on uh, type, uh, he does a lot of research in type one diabetes and um, has a lot of publications on the recommendations. So this is from his guideline paper from uh, our consensus recommendation paper. So if somebody is doing the aerobic exercise, um, for the glucose trends usually go down. So the glucose usually drops during exercise. So the main variables during the aerobic exercise would be intensity, duration of exercise, insulin to glucagon ratio, fitness, nutrition, and initial glucose concentration. So the safe range that to glucose for exercise for to start with aerobic exercise would be about 126 to 180 milligrams per deciliter. So if somebody is doing the resistance, the anaerobic exercise, the strength. So what happens is that when we start the strength exercise, glucose get released from those stores and the blood sugar go up. So um, the, um, if, the, again, the, um, what's affecting that exercise, intensity, number of intervals, insulin concentration um, that or active insulin, counter-regulatory hormones, lactate concentration, fitness, nutrition, and initial glucose concentration. So again, if glucose, if we know that glucose will go up, we can start with the lower target. So I think those targets may help you to decide what type of exercise to start with. So let's say if you're starting with the lower blood sugar, maybe you would choose resistant exercise because if you're gonna choose aerobic exercise and your blood sugar is 90, you may have severe hypoglycemia. Um, but if you start with the um, resistant exercise, you can actually up your blood sugars a little bit. So those high intensity exercise increase oxidative capacity of this uh, skeletal muscle, sparing glycogen and decrease the risk of hypoglycemia. So yeah. Oh, sorry, you have one more question. Um, somebody is asking if you've already had a hypoglycemic event that day, should you not exercise or should you choose a type of exercise based on this? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think it's, again, there is no single answer to this, unfortunately. So it depends on how severe was this hypoglycemic episode. If you just had a mild hypoglycemic episode that you quickly corrected, um, then you can exercise and it's been several hours later. If you had a severe hypoglycemic episode required, you know, 30 plus grams of the glucose and um, you or somebody needed to help you with this, uh, with the correction of glucose, then it's definitely not safe to exercise that day. So I would say if it's mild hypoglycemia and happened several hours prior to that and you had meal in between and your blood sugar is fine, so that should be okay to exercise. But any severe hypoglycemia on that day, that would not be a good idea to exercise. Or you can do maybe very mild anaerobic exercise or resistant exercise on that day. Um, so hypoglycemia develops frequently within 45 minutes of starting anaerobic exercise. And in trained individuals, there could be greater reduction in the blood glucose. So um, it's... But on the other hand, significant reduction of insulin before exercise is not good either because um, there could be more trigger of hyperglycemia and um, ketones because there is not enough insulin on board to prevent this, uh, those ketones. So again, it's uh, kind of challenging. Um, so what are the tricks or what are the recommendations for prevention of hypoglycemia? So the, the, also the important thing to know is the risk of hypoglycemia is um, persistent after the exercise. 
and it can um, kind of persist for about 24 hours or longer after the exercise. And the highest of the risk is nocturnal or nighttime hypoglycemia, especially somebody who exercised in the afternoon. And again, as we said, just talked about uh, with your great question about if you had severe hypoglycemia, which is defined as blood glucose of less than 50 or requiring someone's assistant, so don't exercise that day because you are at risk for more severe hypoglycemia. So the recommendations for um, the starting glucose at exercise. So if you start um, with glucose less than 90, then take about 10 to 20 grams of glucose before starting exercise. Delay exercise until glucose raises over 90 and monitor closely for hypoglycemia. If you start with near target 90 to 124, so again, this is for, for example, for aerobic exercise, as we mentioned, that might be still a little bit on the low side, then take about 10 grams of glucose before starting aerobic exercise. Um, um, for anaerobic exercise, it's okay to get started with this blood glucose as we talked. Um, starting glycemia above 180. So it's uh, you can start with aerobic exercise, but make sure you're very well hydrated. Uh, because glucose concentration um, should come down. But if your blood sugars, so usually we say if it's over 250, then um, you may actually, because that's already the stress for the body. So the blood sugars, even with the aerobic exercise can go up. Um, so, so be careful with that, um, that glucose can actually rise. <laughs> Now, um, we usually talk about how can I safely lose weight with the exercise? So if I eat all those carbs um, before exercise, that sort of defeats my purpose of the, my goal to lose weight. How can I plan for exercise without um, need to consume severe, uh, more of the calories or more of the sugar before that exercise? So that's why we're usually saying it's better to plan um, so if you have, if you plan your exercise, you can reduce your meal insulin bolus by 30 to 50% up to 90 minutes before exercise. Also, you can exercise before the meal. Um, if your blood sugar, if when you have not much insulin on board, but that's assuming that the long acting or your basal insulin is at the level that it's not too high. Um, for some individuals, maybe the level would be too high and um, that's sort of covering some of the meals during the day. Like an example, before starting this talk, I just saw a new patient in the hospital. He's on tandem pump and we just looked at his history of the insulin delivery. His basal insulin delivery is 77% of the total daily dose. And I asked him, um, do you bolus for your meals? And he said, no, my control IQ is a kind of um, helps me with that and controls it. Um, so for those individuals, so if you have that much um, of the basal insulin on board, then you would be at a high risk for lows. But assuming that um, the basal or the long-acting insulin or through the pump or injection is reasonable and just to cover the basal needs, um, then exercising before the meal when you don't have much of the active insulin from the previous meal is a good idea. But if you exercise within a couple of hours after the meal, then reduce plan for it and reduce your bolus by 30 to 50%. Um, so during sports, um, recommendations are to have 30 to 60 grams of carb per hour for aerobic and especially for the high intensity exercise or carb replacement after the exercise to be sure that um, your muscles are getting the glycogen back, whatever was lost during the exercise. So you have enough glycogen stores for overnight and don't go down uh, low for uh, overnight. So more for, for hypoglycemia prevention from different sources. Um, um, so for activities lasting 30 to 45 minutes, uh, for continuous moderate to vigorous intensity uh, cardiac or aerobic exercise, such as jogging, running, moderate intensity swimming, bicycling, cross country, or aerobic play. Reduce the bolus, as we said, 25 to 
if the activity is lasting for over 45 minutes, um, then you might reduce further more by 50 to 75 percent. Um, or if you meal, if you have a meal after the exercise, again, remember we just talked about that after the exercise, you're only also at a high risk for lows. So you can reduce your after meal exercise bolus by 50 percent, especially if that meal before or closer to your bedtime. Uh, for mixed aerobic and anaerobic burst activities, such as hopping, skipping, dancing, gym, gymnastics, uh, tag, uh, uh, or uh, field or team sports. Um, so for those, um, you can reduce by 25% because usually those activities with the burst, so that can ha have some blood sugar rise. Uh, for activities longer duration, over 45 minutes, reduce the bolus by um, 50% and up to 50% reduction, again, of the meal bolus if you do uh, the meal bolus or meal injection after the exercise. So other sort of healthy exercise tips uh, for insulin and medications with <laughs> hypoglycemia potential. And those would be mainly the medications that um, increase your own insulin production. The group of medication that we call sulfonylurea uh, would be glipizide, glyburide, glimepiride, or the short-acting secretagogue such as repaglinide or prandian, starlix, or um, onetaglinide. So those medications would increase the risk of low blood sugars because they increase your own endogenous insulin production. Other medications such as metformin, uh, glucagon-like peptides such as um, semaglutide or zempic or trilicity. So those ones have very low potential for low blood sugar. So those ones would be okay to use. So again, for um, someone who is on insulin or medications that can cause or have hypoglycemia potential for post-exercise hypoglycemia prevention, you can consume 1, 1 to one and a half grams of carbohydrate per kilogram within 30 minutes of exercise and then at two intervals, uh, two hour intervals for up to six hours if you know that you're prone to low blood sugar. You can use also 20 to 30 gram of protein in addition to carbohydrates, which helps to restore muscle protein, uh, but do not restore the glycogen stores. So there's some um, uh, papers and our own uh, Desi Zakariva recommended caffeine intake, uh, five to six milligrams per kilogram. Before exercise, it had been shown in some papers to reduce the risk of hypoglycemia during exercise, and but it may increase the risk of late onset of hypoglycemia. So again, don't um, like load yourself with ca caffeine before exercise. Um, so do not inject the insulin at the site that will be heavier involved in the muscular activity because the absorption of that insulin would be very quick, very fast. But on the other hand, some patients are saying that I, if I need to lower my blood sugar really quickly, so I would inject and do go for a run so that my blood sugar would drop quickly. But again, be careful with this because of the low blood sugar. Um, so as we said that the body becomes more sensitive to that insulin up to 24 to 50, 48 hours after the exercise. So other strategies for prevention of um, blood sugars for both post-exercise uh, and during the night would be, as we mentioned, meal reduction uh, of um, meal dose reduction of 50% after the exercise, snack with low glycemic index at bedtime, 20% reduction in the basal rates for up to six hours uh, at bedtime, or 20% of basal insulin dose reduction for somebody who is on multiple daily injection on exercise days, uh, plus some free carbohydrate snacks. Alcohol is important to remember that it increases the risk of late hypoglycemia. So if you did exercise in the afternoon and then you have your um, alcohol drink with the dinner, you are even at a higher uh, risk for low blood sugar early in the morning. So that's particularly important to remember. And for those individuals uh, would be the recommendations to have some uh, protein and uh, fatty meals uh, for, so it will be sort of longer absorption and uh, 
um, allow safer uh, for, to avoid hypoglycemia overnight. Um, as I usually tell patients, historically, uh, beer goes with peanuts and wine, wine goes with cheese, right? Because of the sort of subconsciously reducing the risk of low blood sugars. Use continuous glucose monitoring devices uh, would be beneficial if possible, if you are um, covered for those devices uh, for, your, um, for the insurance. Again, thank you to COVID. We actually have amazing coverage like we'd never ever had before for continuous glucose monitoring devices. So you can uh, discuss with your doctors if um, that's something that would be recommended for you. Um, so some of the insulin pumps will have suspend for low blood sugars, predicted low glucose suspend. So those would be um, also beneficial for exercise. Some of the pumps can do activity or exercise mode. So those would be uh, also beneficial to exercise. Um, so for um, some additional exercise points, um, so time of exercise is uh, had been studied versus the day versus evening uh, for cardiovascular health. And that had been shown that there was no significant difference on glucose control or cardiovascular health. So it just um, if you do exercise, just do it uh, at any time of the day. But again, if you are doing this afternoon or evening, be careful for the night for the low blood sugars. Uh, for the um, low intensity exercise uh, for um, consumption of 15 to 20 grams per hour glucose prevention if the exercise over 30 minutes and if you're insulin and water is very important to keep yourself very well hydrated. For high intensity exercise, the recommendations are for 75 gram per hour for the activities for longer than two and a half hours. So this is more, um, when I talk about this, um, so this is more for athletes, right? So this is the data that comes for um, studies in athlete and type one diabetes because um, the athlete burn a lot more calories um, than um, you would do during your regular physical activity. And most of us probably wouldn't be able to do longer than two and a half hours of exercise per day. So this is just, uh, that's a dream, but that's um, probably unrealistic for most people. Uh, so this is more again for the athlete and to make sure, to making sure that um, the hydration is adequate. So fluids may have carbohydrates like Gatorade, um, with um, some electrolytes or, um, so the classic actually for replenishing glycogen after exercise is recommended um, in you know, different resources, you'll see chocolate milk. So it's absorbed quickly and it restores your glycogen in the muscles. Um, so again, physical activity is really beneficial. It improves the insulin sensitivity. It reduces the inflammation. Um, and oxidative stress to the blood vessels. It's improved the endothelial function of the blood vessels. It re reduces the progression to kidney disease, reduces cardiovascular risk, reduces mortality. Um, so it's there are definitely lots and lots of benefits of exercise, but um, it's important to exercise safely. So I um, included some um, online resources. Um, those are um, there are some free online YouTube channels with a workout uh, ranging from five to 90 minutes that you can look at. Um, there are some uh, websites for the, on the YouTube. So Fitness uh, Blender has over 500 workouts at home, including hits and uh, strength and, um, um, and, and stretches and different exercise, body weight workout, low impact modification. So it has, um, different um, activities that you can follow. Um, so there are other ones like body project uh, activities for, um, this is for everyone, high energy uh, motivating workout uh, to do from home with the heat and yoga and Pilates. Um, and you can create your own account. And I think they're all still for free. Um, Pop Sugar Fitness, also hundreds of free workouts, um, including dancing and there are some for beginners. Um, so there are also uh, useful resources for the uh, apps. Um, there are some free apps that can be used and um, that you can explore and see which one you may like better. 
And uh, for the home lifting, um, you, you, can, you don't have to buy the weights. You can use water bottles. You can use textbooks. You can use luggage or moving the furniture. You can do the, the soup cans um, or um, any other uh, weights that you can find at home, not necessarily buying those weights. Um, so again, this is just the little um, cartoons to summarize the effect of the exercise that uh, we just all discussed. Um, and um, the little cartoon about welcome to diabetes hotline. If you need a new excuse to, uh, for cheating on your diet, press one. If you need a new excuse, just keep your workout for us too. So hopefully um, none of us are doing this um, kind of phone calls to the hotlines. So thank you very much for your attention and um, I'm happy to take more questions. Hi, Dr. Basina, you have another question. What exercise do you recommend for people who have kneecap injuries and cannot bend their legs? Um, I think that's a great question. I'm not an exercise uh, um, instructor. So I would say that would be better to ask someone who is specifically doing the um, the types of exercise. So, but I think swimming would be safe. Um, usually the, um, some of the bicycling or maybe the so uh, running, jogging probably wouldn't be the best, but uh, some elliptical machines or, um, or uh, stationary bikes or swimming would be, those would be probably totally safe. Uh, but I would check with your orthopedic doctors about this. Okay, great. And then people are just asking if they can get the recording and notes. Um, we're going to post that on the health library um, probably tomorrow or next week early. So you can go back and watch and get all these pearls of wisdom. Um, does anyone else have any questions um, for Dr. Basina? So I can see the question, how to reverse the prediabetes? Yeah, so that is an excellent question. Um, <laughs> so again, diet and exercise is the best. So um, there is a larger study that we have, it called Diabetes Prevention Program. Uh, that study lasted for, I think it was three and a half and then additional years of follow-up. So that had been shown that the uh, diet and exercise um, in prevented development diabetes in 58% of the time. So even the patients who were given metformin, it reduced the, um, the development of diabetes by 33%. So in diet and exercise, almost by 60%. So structured exercise and watching your diet, those are the key. Yeah, that's a great, great question. That is. Um, people are asking, also asking about continuous glucose monitoring devices that are becoming really popular. I know you touched on it, but maybe if you wanted to go into more depth, Dr. Basina? Yeah, so those devices are really, really great. Um, I think, um, and again, coverage is much, much uh, better now than ever been before. So um, I would, whoever is on either insulin or medications that can cause low blood sugar, I would definitely recommend talking to a doctor about this um, to see if they can, um, the doctors would recommend and willing to try to prescribe you the device and if it's covered by insurance. Um, so now the even Medicare would cover the device, the continuous glucose monitoring device for someone who is not an insulin if you do have variable blood sugars and if it's documented by your doctor. So that can be also uh, given. In terms of the type of the CGM or continuous glucose monitoring device, any, um, any type that can be covered, I think would be good. So now um, there we have um, three main um, type of the devices would be Libre from Abbott, uh, Dexcom from Dexcom, Dexcom G6, and then um, the Eversense, which is implantable sensor. So the most commonly used is Libre device, uh, which is now we have uh, three versions. Um, so the Libre 2 and Libre 3. So again, coverage is so much improved. So I would definitely recommend whoever can get coverage for it. Okay, great. You have um, a couple other questions. Somebody's asking if 10,000 steps of walking daily is enough, in your opinion? 
Um, so I think it depends on the person. So usually the 10,000 at least recommended, but if somebody who is already fit and already doing just walking at work, getting your 10,000 steps, so which is excellent. But maybe in addition to that, to plan some um, exercise in addition to that, so you can get your, uh, achieve, so you're already achieving your goals so you can get, um, you know, a few more thousand or a couple at least thousand in addition. But in general, 10,000 is recommended, yeah. Okay, great, you have another question. Um, maybe going over, I think you went over it a little bit already, but is intensive exercise good for people with heart disease? Yeah, so we talked about this. This is a great question. So um, it's important for you to consult your provider if you have heart disease. Um, how, uh, what kind of exercise and what is safe for you to exercise. And that, that only, that very dependent on what is your personal fitness level, right? So if you're just starting exercise from the beginning, so definitely talk to your uh, doctors because you may even need um, to get a stress, um, sort of heart stress exercise to be able to say whether it's safe for you to exercise. So it depends on your risk factors. So if you have underlying heart problem, that definitely consult your doctor before you start exercise program. Okay, and then um, one other question somebody's asking about somebody who's 84 years old with kidney problems, how much exercise would you recommend? So it depends what, again, what is your fitness level? What kind of exercise you're currently doing? Um, so, um, I would start with very um, low intensity exercise if you have not done much of the exercise before. Um, again, the fall prevention would be very, very important. So to make sure that if you have a kidney problem, what is your blood pressure? What medications you're on? Um, so all of that would be important to take into account before um, making decision about type and the duration of exercise. But starting with just a walking outside for maybe even five to 10 minutes a day and then increasing gradually, maybe walking with someone who can, um, you have their companion for walking to make sure it's safe and you are safe and not to walk alone. But again, consult with your doctor before you do this. It also depends on the degree of the kidney problem. So if you have very mild kidney stage one or two, so that would be one recommendation. But if you are, nearing um you know chronic kidney disease stage four or five so that would be a different recommendation so for those individuals the risk of heart disease is really really high um so i would definitely discuss with your doctor all the risks and the recommendations for that particular exercise okay great dr bassino we have no more questions thank you so much for your time and thank everybody for joining on this thursday evening and we really appreciate you sharing all your knowledge so thank you hope everyone has a great night thank you thanks a lot for being here